Um, hi everybody. Um, in this video, what we're going to be doing is going through the mark scheme and trying to think about general exam skills advice to help people get better marks on assessments. Now, all these questions come from the Edexcel past exam papers for A-level economics. And these are the questions that you completed recently um, on an assessment which was focused around um, international competitiveness exchange rate theory, but also links towards a balance of payments as well. Right, OK, now what you've got here um, is a two mark question. So you've got here some data looking at unit labour costs for Austria, Hungary, Estonia and France. Now, what we're looking at here are index numbers. So, for example, we're not suggesting that Estonia uh, have got higher unit labour costs than France, Hungary or Austria. All we've got is how these four different economies have seen their unit labour costs increase since the base year um, in 2010. So from 2010 um, to 2017, which what this data is for, we can see that in Austria, the unit labour costs have increased by 13%. They've grown from 100 to 113 index points. They've grown the most in Estonia. They've grown from 100 to 129 index points. So a 29% growth in unit labour costs across that seven year period. France has seen the lowest increase, 7% across those seven years. Now, remember, if you were working out unit labour costs, then what you'd be doing is um, you would look at what we pay people per hour to produce goods and services. And then we look at the output per person in the hour. So if somebody works in a factory and they make 10 units of output an hour, and we'll pay them £10 per hour, it means each individual unit of output is going to cost £1. OK, so it's the £10 divided by the 10 units of output they create. If in another factory we pay someone again £10 per hour, but they can produce 20 units of output in that time frame, then the unit labour cost will be 50p. So the unit labour cost, what we're looking at is what is the labour cost involved to produce one particular unit of output in a business? OK, now the question is then, explain one likely reason for Estonia's unit labour costs rising faster than in other European countries. Now, where a lot of people went wrong on this one was they ignored the words rising faster. So what we're not looking for is why are they less competitive than other countries? Why are their labour costs increasing faster than other countries? Now, ultimately, there's two different causes of, of rising unit labour costs. One, workers are getting pay rises, so they're earning more money. Or two, they're becoming less productive. So ultimately, it's, it's one of them two different reasons or potentially a combination of both of these two different factors. Now, what I've done, I've given you the mark scheme um, below the question. Now, it's worth noting that the knowledge mark would be for giving the likely reason. OK, so you've got here some possible reasons that you could give. The analysis mark is for what we call linked development. So in other words, developing or articulating your point in a little bit more detail. OK, so if you look at the, um, the, the suggested answers, then what you could go for. The bottom one under knowledge is shortage of labour. So what you could argue is if in Estonia they've got shortages of labour, it could mean there are skill gaps and it could mean they're having to employ less productive workers. So if you've got less productive workers working in your businesses due to skill gaps or labour shortages, then it's likely that the productivity will, will therefore fall, which would increase the unit labour costs. If we've got increases in national minimum wages, well, that would raise labour costs. And assuming people don't become any more productive, it would inflate the unit labour costs. Now, what I've done um, on the right hand side of the page, I've given you a possible answer. So a reason could be a reduction in the productivity of labour. Um, a reduction in access to capital will reduce the output per worker and therefore inflate labour costs of producing units of output. OK, so ultimately all we're saying that if workers become less productive, then the output per worker will fall. If their wage rates aren't falling with it, then the unit labour costs will start to increase. Right, okie dokie everyone. Uh, the next question was another two marker. Explain how Estonia's competitiveness could be affected by rising unit labour costs. Now, the knowledge mark is for simply saying, well, 
overall, um, if they've got increasing unit labour costs, then they're reducing their international competitiveness. So they're becoming less competitive than other countries across the world, or potentially so anyway. Depends on what their starting point was. But then look at the Mark scheme again. The analysis would be for that idea of a linked development again. OK, so why will this mean they become less competitive or attempt to expand or elaborate on that point in a little bit more detail? So you, again, you can see on the right hand side of the page an answer that I've put together for this question. So I give you the knowledge mark for saying that competitiveness for Estonia has fallen. Higher unit labour costs will increase business costs, which is a form of cost push inflation and therefore it's higher prices, which means Estonian output will be more expensive or priced out of markets across the world. OK, so one mark for knowledge, which is what will happen to competitiveness. And then the second mark is what we call linked development. Right now, the multiple choice, um, the increase in Austria's unit labour cost between 2010 and 2017 is. And if I go back and show you the data, we're looking at Austria. What we know is the base was in, in 2010 was 100 index points. And by 2017, it's grown to 113. So what we've got, we've got a C, a 13% increase in their unit labour costs. OK, so C is the only one that would make sense here. Right now, the next question, um, this was a 12 marker. Now, what I'm going to suggest, first of all, is that when you answer a question like this, really what you should be doing is looking at the question before you read the extract. Because what you can do then, if you know what the question is, you can be looking for um, possible arguments to articulate your answer when you put together an answer for this question. So look what we've got for 12 marks. Apart from its effects on investment, discuss the likely benefits to the Chinese economy of the government devaluing the currency. Right, OK, now the key thing here is it does say benefits, so it needs more than one. So what we would recommend here that you would be discussing two different benefits. The key thing, though, is it must link to China. And then what you would need to do for each benefit that you give would be to evaluate it. So what you could be thinking is, well, overall, that this is a benefit for this reason. But then you might think about a counterbalance. What could be a problem with this that you've mentioned before? Or it could be to what extent is it a benefit? What might it depend on? OK, now the key thing is what your evaluation must do is to link in with your original benefit. OK, now what I've done, I've been through the extracts and I've pulled out what I think are the key things to take away from this extract. These are the things that you should have been talking about in your answer. Now, what I've done, I've identified three problems in China. So the first one, they've got disinflation and potential risks of deflation. Now, remember, what we tend to recommend is in Britain anyway, that the inflation rate should be roughly 2%. When you're experiencing disinflation, it's normally associated with a reduction in aggregate demand. We tend to associate it with stage in the business cycle where businesses and therefore people um, are suffering from a reduction in animal spirits. They're becoming more pessimistic and less confident about the future of the economy. Now, if you've got disinflation, you've got risks of deflation, well, that would lead to really, really bad animal spirits. Uh, people stop investing, people stop buying, people wait for price reductions, and that can create a, a growth in negative output gaps. Uh, they've also got this problem, the overcapacity. They've got things such as 6.8 trillion, I think it was, um, was it pounds or dollars worth? Dollars, I beg your pardon, of squandered investment. They've got lots of steel mills that they don't need in their economy. So to me, what China is suffering from is a negative output gap situation. And to back this up, um, they've got insufficient domestic demand for goods and services, but also they've got a reduction in export demand across the world. Well, that's going to hold back economic growth. So really, when you think about it, then, they've got a big negative output gap. They've made loads of big investments into in infrastructure that they don't need unused steel mills, etc. Um, and the problem that the compounds this is they've got falling um, aggregate demand, falling domestic demand. So Chinese people are buying fewer Chinese goods and services and people across the world are also not buying as many Chinese goods and services. So this is in risking that growth of disinflation 
and therefore deflation in the economy. So what we've got, we've got some key problems in the Chinese economy that need fixing. So the solution being suggested is a devaluation. So remember, a currency devaluation is where the government or the central bank deliberately manipulate down the value of that currency. Now, this could be achieved through a reduction in interest rates, which would lower the demand for the Chinese renminbi across the world uh, due to less investment going in. Or it could be achieved through um, selling big quantities of the renminbi in global markets. You increase supply, you force the value downwards, especially when you're using that money to go and buy lots and lots of foreign currency. OK, so the solution being suggested is that we have a devaluation and we've got some lovely quotes from the extract here as well. Um, a devaluation would help create inflation that could help export growth. Uh, but this could be really, really bad for Chinese consumers due to higher import prices. You've got other problems uh, been suggested, risk of a currency war with Japan and South Korea. So when we start thinking about an answer for this question, these points should really be incorporated into our answer. Right, anyway, let's think first of all about the knowledge, application and analysis marks. So you can see here that there will be eight marks in total for the quality of your knowledge, application and analysis. Now you've got to get across two different benefits for the Chinese economy of devaluing the currency. Now look at the diagram that I've drawn for this. When a currency gets weaker, what we know is there should be an outward shift in aggregate demand. The reason being would be that um, the foreign currency price of Chinese exports will now be cheaper. So there was foreign people have got to sacrifice less of their own currency to buy the red NIMBY, to buy Chinese goods and services. But also, um, imports in China will start to become more expensive in the red NIMBY price. And that would mean that Chinese people would shift the demand away from foreign goods and services towards Chinese produced goods and services. So AD will move outward due to that improvement in trade performance. Now, there will be an inward shift in short run aggregate supply due to the increase in the cost of importing things such as raw materials for businesses. Now, when you look at that diagram, everyone, this gives you lots of really, really good benefits for China. So what we know is in China, there's risk of disinflation, even the possibility of deflation. So straight away, look at what this diagram shows us. Um, we're going to get both demand pull and cost push inflationary pressures. And that will take away that potential problem of disinflation and deflation in the economy. We've already mentioned that it would increase the volume of exports and reduce the volume of imports. Well, that could be really, really good for improving trade performance. And if trade performance improves, again, there'll be a, a, the outward shift in aggregate demand. Now, when you've got that movement outwards in aggregate demand, it's also going to create more jobs um, because you've got this export led growth and a growth in demand for domestic goods and services in general. Well, that creates more cyclical employment that can help tackle that negative output gap problem. We're starting to use up all that spare capacity in the economy. So guys, what we could do, we could argue most of those different points by using this diagram. Now, a word of warning, where a lot of people went wrong on this question was they were too general. They didn't talk about the benefits for, of, for China. They just talked about benefits in general of a currency getting weaker. We need this to be linked to China. Now, just to illustrate this point, look what I've done here. Now, I have included here um, the evaluation points, but look on the right hand side of what I've done. Now, remember, on this answer here, you will be expected to include two different benefits for China. They need to be linked to China. So look what I've put down here. Uh, benefit devaluation will support export growth. So what I could say, well, what we know in China is they've got this risk of disinflation. They've got these negative output gaps problem. Well, if the weaker currency raises the competitiveness of Chinese goods across the world, that will lead to export led growth and that would help tackle that negative output gap problem that they're experiencing in China. And of course, what that would then do is to tackle that risk of disinflation. But you've got a problem and this is now thinking about the value valuation. Um, if the renminbi is now less valuable than what it was before, 
this could worsen the terms of trade. In other words, imports start to become relatively more expensive. Well, that's really, really bad for domestic citizens. If they're now paying more to buy imports, well, that's going to be a contraction in demand. It would reduce their consumer surplus. And then what you could argue is if people are now just dedicate more of their income towards buying their imports, they've got less disposable income left over to buy domestic goods and services. So that could actually also be quite bad for economic growth if it's lowering people's ability to buy domestic goods and services. Um, and that's kind of building into that next point as well. What we know is as a benefit, it would reduce import demand. That might create a growing demand for all those unused steel mills across China. That again helps aggregate demand to move outwards. But we also know that Chinese firms will have to pay more to access that global supply chain. And that will create more cost push inflation. And that could also, again, you know, lead to lower demand from Chinese people for goods and services. If more of their money is going towards paying for these goods that require imports to come into the economy. And then final one, uh, what we should argue is that a devaluation should improve trade performance. Uh, we can see that, you know, you've got Japan that are um, currently uh, weakening their currency. So this could be, you know, in response to the, what, what they're doing. So the idea would be that um, the volume of exports would increase due to the reduced foreign currency price of Chinese goods. But then imports coming into China will become more expensive in the renminbi price. So the volume of imports will fall. But what we do know is the J-curve and Marshall learning condition have got to be factored in. And this is this idea that what we've focused on so far is the volume of imports will fall and the volume of exports will increase. But that doesn't mean the value of them will move in the right direction. So what we know is in the short run, uh, when the Marshall learning condition is not met, well, imports and exports could be priced inelastic in demand. So if there isn't a domestic alternative or there's strong habitual behaviour, then as imports start to become more expensive, um, there'll be an insignificant or unresponsive fall in demand, which could lead to the growth in spending. That could worsen trade performance. And of course, that could lead to an inward shift in aggregate demand and therefore lead to even more disinflation kicking into um, China. We could then talk about in the long run, though, it, it should improve trade performance. It's always good if you can talk about, you know, short run against long run impacts. Now, guys, what I've done there in these three bullet points on the right hand side of the screen, I've given you um, three possible arguments you can give with the evaluation. You will be expected to talk about two of these benefits, but with the counterbalance as well. Without that evaluation, you'll be capped at a maximum of eight out of 12. OK, right now, the next question was a calculation question. So you've got here the data which shows the price of one euro in pounds. Now, the question is asking you to use figure one, which is this data here, to calculate the percentage change in the value of the euro in pounds from the start of 09 to the start of 2015. And what they've done really nicely, they've given you these black bullet points that they want you to use. So you will get a mark if you identify that at the start of 09, one euro was worth 95p. You would then cement that mark if you then said by the start of 2015, one euro was worth 75p. So when you think about it, what we've got here is a depreciation in the value of the euro. It used to be worth 95p. It would now only get you 75p. I then look at the mark scheme. We've got one mark so far for identifying the right data. Application. If you can successfully identify the percentage change formula. So the idea of the change or the difference divided by the original multiplied by 100. If you can then input the data into that, you will um, pick up the second mark for application and then look at the analysis. It's actually calculating the percentage change. Now, where a lot of people go wrong here is they calculated it to be 21%. But because it's a drop in the value, it should be a minus number. And look at why the change is minus um, 0.2. It's gone from 95p down to 75p. So it's a 0.2 pounds drop in the value of the euro. So 0.2 divided by the original, 0.95, multiplied by 100. 
So the examiner would award anything between minus 21 and minus 21.1. So you have got a small margin of error that you can use in your answer there. Right, now the last question was this one. Uh, since mid-2015, the euro has appreciated. Assess the likely impact of an appreciation of the euro on the current account of the balance of payments for eurozone countries. Right, everyone. Now, before we tackle this question, let's just think about what the current account is. This is the part of the balance of payments looking at inflows and outflows of money uh, linked to incomes. So on the current account, we have four different components. I've only given you three here, but that's because trade performance has got two. <coughs> Excuse me. We've got trading goods and we've got trading services. We've then got primary incomes and we've got secondary incomes. OK, so trade performance is the value of exports of goods and services. Take away the value of the imports of goods and services. Primary incomes are inflows and outflows of money, um, incomes linked to investments. So, for example, if a British firm invests overseas, they will get an income back in terms of profit or dividends that would flood back into our economy. If a Spanish person um, has lent money to British people to buy property, well, the interest rates will be the income that they suck out of the economy. Secondary incomes is linked to government transfers. OK, this could be linked to foreign aid, you know, the UK's contribution towards the European Union, um, humanitarian aid across the world, you know, when there's natural disasters, those types of things. Now, for this question, the key things are it's about the Eurozone countries. It's not about the UK. It's about the Eurozone. So those economies that adopt to the Euro, this could be, you know, France, Germany, Italy, Spain, Portugal, etc., and what we should be talking about here is how an appreciation of the euro would impact on trade performance. OK, now what you've then got below um, that explanation of the current account is this formula, spiced. So appreciation, small appreciation of the euro towards the end of 2015. What we've done, we've looked at the data and we've seen that during 2015, the euro did appreciate by, say, two or three P or so. So what we've got to do is to assess the impact of this uh, appreciation of the euro on their current account of the balance of payments. Right, then I've given you three bullet points which I would expect to see. And if you get this right, you're going to get six out of ten from the word go. So when the euro appreciates against uh, things such as the pound, then what it would do, it would raise the foreign currency price of those euro exports. And that would reduce the volume of the exports, um, leaving the, uh, the, the Eurozone. But also, what the stronger currency will also do, it would reduce the Euro price of imports. So the volume of imports coming into uh, the Eurozone will increase. Now, if you think about it, if there's a reduction in the volume of exports and an increase in the volume of imports coming into the Eurozone, this would lead to worse trade performance. So I've then got that wonderful link back to the question. This would therefore weaken the current account performance of the Eurozone economies. Now, where a lot of you went wrong, you start telling me, well, when you have got an appreciation, it's going to lead to trade deficit. Well, not necessarily. Um, if you're starting out from a position of um, a huge trade surplus, then this could simply lead to a reduction in your trade surplus. So it's far better to use words such as improving or worsening trade performance. So, guys, just to reiterate here, to get six out of ten in your first paragraph, what you should be saying is that uh, as the euro appreciates, the foreign currency price of eurozone exports will become more expensive. Therefore, there'll be a reduction in the demand of these goods so due to lower international competitiveness. There will also be an increase um, in imports coming into the eurozone due to the reduction in the euro price of these goods and services. So if you're going to be importing more goods and services and exporting less, it would weaken your trade performance and therefore lead to a worsening of current account performance. And that would literally get me six out of ten. Now, for evaluation, you've got three different points that I will be looking to talk about. You only need to talk about one of these. So you can talk about volume against value. 
Um, what we know is that when the currency appreciates, there'll be an increase in volume of imports and a reduction in the volume of exports. But when you measure trade performance, we're looking at the value. So what we could talk about is the fact that uh, when we could draw the J-curve inverted here, that when you appreciate the currency, if the demand for your imports are fairly price inelastic, it means the martial learn condition is not, not achieved. This could be due to habitual behavior, et cetera. Um, the inability for foreign firms to increase production to benefit from that growth in competitiveness. But the idea is if imports are price inelastic in demand, then overall spending on these imports might actually fall, even though they become more expensive. OK, so the volume of imports would increase, but the value would actually fall. It's not until the long run when these imports start to become more elastic will the value of them potentially start to increase. So I've got some wonderful links there to short run against long run. Now, we could then also argue, though, that the Eurozone um, might argue that across the world, the demand for their goods and services is not driven by price anyway. It could be driven by non-price factors. So, you know, Eurozone economies might export high quality goods and services that might be particularly innovative. So even at the increased foreign currency price, um, it might have a significant impact on the demand for these exports. Well, that would therefore not lead to a significant impact on the current account. I could then talk about magnitude. Well, how much actually has the euro appreciated? For basic on the data on the previous question, well, in 2015, it was a very small percent. So that small increase in percent might not wipe out their competitiveness anyway. Now, if it doesn't really reduce really their competitiveness, it will have a very minimal impact on their balance of pay on their current account performance on the balance of payments. It also depends which currencies they've appreciated against. If, for example, um, the countries they export to, their, their country hasn't appreciated against those, it will have a very minimal impact on export performance. So you've got to think about it in terms of, well, which economies, currencies has the euro appreciated against? Now, what you've got to be really, really careful of on a question like this is not to drift away from the question. It's really easy to start talking about, you know, the impacts on economic growth, on employment, government finances, economic development. This question is really, really clear. They want you to talk about the impacts on the current account. So what I would need is that really clear link back. The currency appreciation would lead to a worsening of the current account for this reason here. And then I could talk about the fact that export demand might um, fall and import demand might increase. And then explain why that would lead to the current account deteriorating. Evaluation, why this might not have this impact on the current account. So using the words from the question to develop your chain of analysis is such an important thing to be able to do. Right, everyone, um, I hope you found that useful. So you've got there a, an overview of the March schemes and how I would have tackled each of these different questions. Thank you very much.